Okay, today is October the 31st, uh, happy Halloween, and it's also our 82nd uh, Western Desiderata Extinction Audi meeting, and we'll start off with our, um, if you have any contacts that you've reached out to, so uh, finally we're going to have a talk with uh, Derek Jensen in uh, November, so please uh, look out for that, and uh, that's all I have for now, everyone else kind of. Uh, fell apart, but that's it. I have no contacts that have got back to me. I sent some reminder emails, but I have nothing to to announce. Yeah, it's been quiet from for me. I haven't really got anything either. Um, yeah, I've been doing cartoons and stuff. <laughs> I'll post them when I'm when I'm finished. But um, yeah, I've been trying to write stuff and um, I've been doing all, all that kind of angle with uh, with uh, into like Britain and stuff, and they they seem to be carrying on. They're doing quite well. They're doing, getting quite a good exposure. But um, I haven't been trying to contact them. I just assume they they're way too busy, and they're going to be a cop. So. I presume we're just going to wait till after COP, so see what happens then. Yeah, so whatever, um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so going south is just saying that there was this thing called ICE 911. It's um, called um, the, <clears throat> um, the Arctic Ice Project. They changed the name of it. But it's this thing for this woman called Dr. Leslie Fields. And what they've been trying to do is trying to start these geoengineering experiments for glass microspherules. I don't know if you remember that story there. So, yeah, we wrote up a thing together for to try and say that, you know, to uh, stop them doing this project in Sweden. Sweden seems to be kind of okay with doing geoengineering for some reason. Maybe they've got backs under their skin or something. But they, uh, it's really incredible how lame the science is on that. Um, what's they, they've been thwarted now they, they were going to get some money from the, the EU and I think from Sweden but the um, indigenous people have been objecting they all, indigenous people the Sami they objected to SRM experiments and uh, in, in, in Russia and in America I think there were three objections so that's kept SRM on the ground 
that uh, microspherial project is is really really dumb uh, Sorry, because you explain SRM. You know, what, as solar radiation management. That's um, David Keith. So we we spoke about that on the meeting this morning on the Eastern meeting, um, and that's the really really dangerous one. That's one backed by Bill Gates, and that's that's the scary one. Um, but it's that's basically putting sulfates or sulfuric acid in the stratosphere, um, dimming the the Earth by about three percent, um, and uh, yeah, it's it'll almost certainly work. But it's crazy, crazy uh, scheme to to even think about doing. But they they're pushing ahead. It's it's going to be Plan A very soon, um, and so yeah. So um, all the others are silly. The only other ones are marine cloud brightening. That's where you get a ship and you uh, spray water as high as you can into marine clouds to make them denser so they reflect more, increase the, the albedo, which I think is also freaking stupid because it's like putting, you know, big vacuum cleaner in the sea. You want, you know, you're just hoovering up marine life and shredding it in a liquidizer. And... I don't think you can you can separate marine life in a filter properly, and and then you still got to drive this stuff into the air, which is kind of self defeating. They also uh, that's also risky because the water vapor is one of the, the most potent greenhouse gases, and this is putting water vapor up into the air. So they have to do it very carefully to make sure that they, the brightening is offsetting the warming. But it's also crazy ass shit. But Beckwith likes it, um, and so so does uh, the um, things like Peter Wadhams likes it. But the uh, glass ferrules thing is to get um, about a micro six micron layer of these glass micro spherules are a commercial product. They they have they little glass beads about. Um, uh, six microns, 64 microns across, and they have a little, they're hollow, they have a little bubble in them, and so they actually float. And they want to spread these all over the Arctic. It's just nuts. Um, in one of the videos where this woman, Leslie Fields, is the principal investigator, on them, um, I put on one of the videos, because glass is something I know something about, and I said, you know, you know that there are two tons of CO2 emitted for every ton of glass. <laughs> and she didn't know that. She said, oh, you know, oh, that's something to do with the glass industry. But I went to make sure I've written stuff up, which was, you know, at least two tons of CO2 to a ton of glass um, with, you know, natural gas is the commonest thing to, to melt glass. But uh, all the things that I could find said three tons, 3.04 tons for every ton of glass. So in every ton of those microspherules you spread on the Arctic, you're putting three tons of CO2. And this, the, the number, there, there wouldn't be enough silica to actually do it. It's, um, it's, it's, it's mad. But anyway, uh, going south then pointed, pointed out to me that this, it's so harebrained because she's got it wrong. She's, she thinks that it's like, they did a test in the lake in Montana. They sprinkled the stuff on the lake and then it's, yeah, of course, it, it was insulating. But the <clears throat> uh, what Going South was saying was it's not the solar radiation falling on the, the ice that's melting it. It's the ocean currents underneath it. So it's got nothing to do <laughs> with, the, <laughs> with the albedo or changing the albedo uh, because the warming's coming from, uh, you know, the, influx of Atlantic and Pacific. So it's, you know, and so, and they did tests. I mean, it's it would be a disaster from the point of view of marine life and uh, uptake on that. But they, they said, oh, well, it's all safe because they they got a tank and they chucked a handful of this stuff in and whatever the sturgeon, whatever in the fish tank didn't get it. It's like, you know, like windblown gla glass will, you know, it gives you uh, silicosis. So, it would give, you know, seals and um, whales and things, any air-breathing mammal will get silicosis from this stuff when blown around. And it'll last thousands of years. It, it's, it'll take a long time for that 
to degrade. They say oh, it'll weather, um, uh, you know, in the seawater. But, you know, they don't know the what really going to happen to it. Anyway, it's crazy. It's more of the crazy old shit that these people are trying. Um, but, you know, that's, um, we, we were going to try send a letter, but it looks like it's not going to happen now because other people saw the sense. <laughs> so far, people are seeing sense. But would it would it have the, worked better in the equator around the equator then, if it was really trying to affect the albedo, reflect more sunlight? Yeah, really, to to hold. You know, I mean, you, you you could just put white paint down. If you just just want to use the brightening effect, you could, you know, put it in the tropics with white paint. I mean, they. they they have super white paint now, and they could just, you know, start painting cities. But you see that what's silly about these things is the sheer scale. So you have to have a look at the manufacturing footprint, and everything has a huge carbon footprint. Any manufacturing process just about has a huge carbon footprint. And then, you know, it's um, so you have to offset that. Um, and then these things are environmental hazards. You, you can't just start sprinkling stuff around and you need tons and tons i mean we're, we're talking six thousand times we worked out on the back of an envelope you'd need six thousand times the output of the current glass industry to to you know to do like one percent of the arctic ice <laughs> it's, it's like crazy crazy um, so it's never going to happen. There's no way of dispersing these things. And, you know, by the time you've actually got some dispersal mechanism, you've got to factor in all the transport costs and stuff. It's all on losing proposition. But, um, yeah. So, oh. um, we lost Ryan there for a second. Yeah, anyway, so so that was that. Was that. Does anybody want to talk any more about it? Yeah, Sintef in Norway. Uh, they won't deploy before it's cleared by scientists in Sintef in Norway. So Sintef is the Science and Technology uh, Institute, I think, in, in Norway. And so it'll they'll get some sanity check on these people. Um, then it's the effect of waves. Uh, if you've seen pollen in the in the lake, yeah, it te um, tends to be back together in to narrow bands yeah well that's that's what what i thought i thought um, you know they they spread it really thin on a lake in montana and uh, um they uh they did it with a, a spreader you know basically a seed spreader and so you can't do that in the arctic and so it'll be you know if you've if you've seen a snow blow or something like that if they spread it like that they they're thinking well you can do it about you know six maybe half a millimeter less than half a millimeter there's no way you'll be able to do that because you know it'll uh, go like sand dunes it'll it'll um it'll start uh, getting ripples and stuff in it so you can't you can't do this it's, it's mad you would you would need a lot of it thick and then it would be windblown you'd have this windblown abrasive glass it's nuts just so it's just it's just you know you you have to pinch yourself and you say we're doing all of this we're proposing all of this because people don't want to stop you know we, we've we've had the entire revolution now since 1750 but we've only had electricity for a hundred years and we've had you know the grid and you know really the great acceleration is the last 50 years so in the bullshit we've done in my lifetime they they doing all this desperate stuff because they don't want to stop. They don't they don't want to roll back to you know the year I was born in. <laughs> that's that's how addicted we are. They, they would prefer to risk the entire planet than just roll back the economy in fifty years. It's like wow, it's you, you, we are pathologically sick. Yeah, I, we I was, have to stop. Uh, one thing I've been you know just kind of uh, frightened of uh, for the past two weeks because I didn't realize it was an issue is the the poisoning 
of the oceans with all the toxins from from cities around sea level uh, from sea level rise like the the amount of absolute horrible toxins that are in our cities that are going to be under the ocean um, is going to leach out into the ocean and I I I thought about all of the 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 um, you know what kind of effect that's going to have on the ecosystem there and then the, to move all of our cities away from the coasts um, the amount of fossil fuels needed to do that would completely defeat the purpose of trying and um, you know, to, to just clean that up, purely just clean that up would be, you know, an enormous, it'd probably take the amount of uh, a yearly GDP of, of earth to do just back of the napkin, um, uh, calculation or whatever. I, I haven't done any of the math for it, but it just seems like an insurmountable amount of, uh, effort, um, that people couldn't afford to do. Uh, and the and it would require enormous amounts of fossil fuels so it would backfire even if we tried yeah you know um the, the in the us and i think around the world really most most to harbors ports um especially if they were used by the navy or superfund sites so uh the this the all the ports in in the us they they are they haven't cleaned them up because it's too expensive. So you know, and they they're all within a, about a meter of sea level. So when when the sea level rises, um, yeah, basically then the cleanup happens with the ocean. But the all of this all the toxins from cities are coming into the ocean right now from runoff, and it's something I know very well because I make my water from a desalinator. And I've got to, you know, like where I am now is like a small little place. It's not, not very big, but I can't make water here because the water is not clean enough. I'll contaminate my tongue. And so it's, it's not that they pumping sewage and stuff into the water. It's just that, you know, you have rats and wheels disease and, uh, you know, dead cats. And the cities are extremely uh, dirty, toxic, you know, full of entropy. Um, and, and disease, and so, you know, and all these chemicals. So th these are flooding continuously. This city is just a weeping saw into the sea. It's either into a river first or into a sea. So I can't make any um, water, you know, except miles away from a river mouth or from, from, the, from the shore, um, from, from a town. So, you know, I see it. People don't realize they they think the sea is just a dumping ground, which is an infinite dumping ground, and it's it's um, it's you know what's probably going to happen is that you know with the temperature rise, life on land will become untenable and it will return to the sea, and everybody thinks of it the other way around. They think the the sea's going to go if the sea the sea goes, life on land's an afterthought. So yeah, so um, but. Yeah, there was something else that uh, I want to say about the. Um, oh yeah, just to rebuild all those cities. It's an interesting thing. I met a guy a couple of years ago, who was sailing a Dutch guy, and he was really um, into this project. He was a rich guy, um, and he was into all these environmental things. And he, he his big thing, which he shared all the documents with me with, and, and that was before this. Um, carbon-free concrete. So you can make concrete. They went back and looked at the Roman recipe and the Chinese recipe and the Great Wall and, and they said, you know, concrete is so energy intensive and you know, puts out so much CO2 because of the line. So he said they, they developed this or, or you know, the research. This is the problem with scientists and, and these geeks. Um, is they, they think that these are engineering problems with engineering fixes. And it's not an engineering problem. They engineered concrete that had zero CO2 emissions. And you think, great, you know, it's, concrete is like something like 10% of the CO2 emissions around the world. And you think, okay, that's eliminated 10%. No, they couldn't get anywhere with, the, with this concrete. Although they've solved the technical problems and then, you know, it can scale and everything. So no one will touch it. And the, the reason is because 
concrete around the world is run by the mafia. So they they went to the mafia guys and all the you know all the unions and stuff that you have to jump through hoops if you want to you know pour concrete, and they said no we can't we can't touch it because they said like you know it it's a very um, they, they have all these arrangements they're all crooks right they will have all these arrangements so that the the guys who you know gets the lime is part of a monopoly and if if you cut him out. You will get a gang war around the world with these concrete guys. They say they're not going to touch the relationships they have because they're very delicate. They're very old relationships, and you know these are guys that'll break your knees. So the guys saying like, "Yeah, we love your concrete, but no, we, we're not going to upset all the you know the status quo of the the concrete industry for you." And and so you know he he's going to governments and stuff like that. And the governments are all owned by these guys. The governments are all in their pocket. Now scientists don't do that. You see endless thing on the article, you know, all these guys like Dr. Leslie Fields there. She's she's saying, you know, this is a technical problem. We need technical fixes. No, it's got really almost nothing to do with technical problems. Uh, tech, uh, and so it, it's so what they're doing with engineering, what David Keith and all of these guys are doing is these are all the naive, out of touch, ivory tower geeks that have said, like, we've tried for 30 years to try and get uh, to change the political system and the social thing. They said, it's just too difficult. We can't engineer people. They're just too difficult. So what we're going to do is engineer the planet. If people are too difficult, let's see how we do with the ecosystem. So it's that same engineering mindset saying, if they'll do social engineering, now we'll just <laughs> try climate engineering. And so, you know, and all these kids have faith in that. They all say, yeah, science, you know, insulate Britain is, yeah, we will you know, take over the government and then, you know, we'll set up citizens' assemblies. They'll all be advised by scientists. It's like, wow, so naive. Yeah, and so anyway, Ryan, um, unless anybody's got anything else to say, I um, the last time I thought, uh, last weekend, I thought that you were going to be on the Eastern one, the uh, Eastern Extinction ID meeting, right? So so um, we talked about AI on, on that one, thinking, oh, well, you're not going to turn up, and then you turned up on the Western one, and we, we talked about something else. But... Um, I would like to, unless anybody's got something else they want to talk about, I would like to go into artificial intelligence again. And particularly, I'm very keen on pursuing what, what exactly is intelligence, because, you know, it's a, a good route to, to wisdom and to you know, self-knowledge. So it's, I, th I think, the, you know, as I said, the genesis of AI is not to solve all our problems. It's, it's to, to show us who we are. It's a mirror. But, uh, because it's not intelligence. It's anti-intelligence. And so it's, you know, it, it's uh, by studying it and asking exactly what is wisdom, what is intelligence, then you can start to see what human intelligence is. And I think that's the start of getting an epiphany. Does Sounds anybody like have me. anything... Okay. Yeah. So I don't know if you watched the the last one, but okay. There, there's there's something which I'd like to highlight, and this it, it's really in quite intertwined with stuff like geoengineering. So you know, geoengineering. Uh, if you see the one that we did this morning, talking about David Keith and solar radiation and the measurement problem in cybernetics, it's really if you try and control a complex system. Um, like David Keith thinks you can, <laughs> um, because he doesn't understand feedback. He thinks that it's uh, it assists you. He doesn't realize it screws you up. But anyway, uh, all all of these cybernetic systems were the genesis of um, cybernetics and some of this machine learning and stuff like that. So, um, and then you know that you had Paul Shannon's mouse, you know. Theseus that could do mazes, mechanical mouse that could do mazes, and would get stuck in a feedback loop and start going round and round in circles. And 
the guys um, like Margaret Mead and Jeffrey Bateson and so forth were very excited about that because they said, you know, you've recreated a human neurosis. And I think you did. That was a mechanical version of a human neurosis. But, okay, the, but <clears throat> so here's what I want to propose to you about, you know, about tackling what exactly intelligence is. And I think that, it, again, everybody, what I said before about AI is upside down. The, um, AI engineers and stuff are thinking upside down, and I think Turing and that was thinking upside down too. So, just for everybody else who isn't uh, in, into software engineering and stuff, uh, if you open up a textbook, very first page of a you know in, information science textbook, will say, "What is a computer?" Well, some version of this, and they'll say, "It's an input." and then a process, and then an output. And then why these guys have it upside down is they're saying, by looking at the output, we can tell if something's intelligent. And I'm saying, no, you can't. That's, you fundamentally, mathematically, provably cannot. So there's that one video that I posted where the guy was saying, you know, if you, about an IQ test, the math, math logger um, video, where he was saying, you know, any sequence, you can have any sequence you like, and you can show that it has a valid algorithm behind it. And so the IQ tests are nuts. I told you about it at our school where I said that, you know, came to the conclusion that an IQ test is just seeing if you can figure out the thinking process of the guy that set the test. There is no logical answer to any of the, you know, spot the odd one out or what's the next in the sequence kind of questions. Um, and it's mathematically provable that way. So, so you're saying, well, then what is the, you know, how, what is an intelligent output? You say, you can't, you couldn't say. You, you won't be able to say what an intelligent uh, output is. So, uh, so let's think about something like, um, uh, you know, something can can sound intelligent, but it, it might not be. I, I mentioned about soul in the Chinese room, and they said, you know, it's it, it uh, can mimic somebody can, you know, uh, just by following rote learning process, they can imitate uh, um, as if they can speak Chinese, but they can't. They just know when you get this, these characters, go to this store and give this response. And so I can give a they don't really understand Chinese. to that that's similar to that uh, the Searle example um, the example of sfectiousness uh, so uh, a, a wasp of a certain kind I forget what it is but uh, the wasps uh, scientific name is sfex something um, and the the behavior is these wasps burrow into um, into a particular um, hole or they take over a burrow and um, they lay their eggs in there. And the um, this particular wasp goes out and finds like a grasshopper and uh, uh, stuns it and brings it back in front of the, the, the hole for the larvae to, to, um, to devour. And this looks like very intelligent behavior, like it's forward planning, it's it's anticipating the needs of, of the the um, the larvae, and uh, it, you'd think there's just so much cognition behind it. But if you um, if you move the uh, the larvae over by you know one inch, um, the the um, the wasp just goes oh oh and flies out and gets another one. Uh, and puts it right next to it, and and it um, it clearly doesn't notice that it could just bump it once, like a few centimeters over, um, and uh, it doesn't know that that's actually there. Another example is like the the albatross can't detect its own um, kids uh, if if it falls out of the nest, so the the kid just dies, right? If the if the because uh, it can only detect that it has stayed in the nest. Um, so it's very, very primitive um, 
implementation of an algorithm that's hard coded to give seemingly intelligent behavior, but is clearly not intelligent um, be because um, we, we're just assuming in intelligence behind that hard coding um, when, when there is none. It's just part of the genetic code or part of the patterns that, that are often established. So it's similar to Searle's Chinese room, like looking it up in a database, because it's essentially a hard coded lookup in the in the wasp's um, mind. It's a it's a simple pattern that it will do regardless of whether it knows what it's doing. Yeah, I think it's called a fixed action potential. Correct. It's, it's just an instinct. It's it's not actually doing com computation. Um. So. Yeah, there was another brilliant example from Animal Kingdom that I just thought of while you're talking, but I forgot by the, by the time you finished. Um, uh, what was it? Was uh, also to do with insects, I think. Um, or maybe birds. Yeah, but anyway, it's a, there, there are lots of those examples in the in the Animal Kingdom which um, you know show that. These are not uh, making intelligent decisions. They're just, uh, you know, responding to a very basic um, action-reaction pattern. Um, and so, uh, so uh, yeah. So, okay. So now, what I wanted to do was to propose something to give you an example. Is to say, okay, let's let's take it from the point of view of an un unintelligent response. So, if you have, um, say, a Turing test of some machine or some process or entity say is this machine intelligent um, you'd say well if it gave random responses you would assume if they didn't have any pattern or structure you'd have to say now nah, this is this is a stupid thing um, it's only when it it seems to understand you and responds to the patterns that you have in your head that you start to say that it's intelligent so, uh, so looking at from the point of view of an output, then you could, if you go with me on this, then you'll say, well, like, if I give you a random output, then you'll be able to say, well, this is not intelligent. And at least you can strike off some subset of unintelligent responses. Now, most people would think, okay, we're all on solid ground. Um, this also, by the way, just as a tangent for what I was talking about this morning with David Keith and the measurement problem for actually doing, you know, sulfates in the atmosphere, is uh, it's terribly difficult to fit, to monitor what you're doing in terms of, uh, you know, because it's cybernetic and it has feedback. So you have it's much like the autopilot on a on a yacht and or a boat, and it has gain and response. So those two parameters, and so, you know, you, you, David Keith was talking about pilot-induced turbulence, the example that I used, funny enough, to explain to why you don't want to do this. But he still doesn't, he and his team, they still don't seem to grasp the fact that you can't do measurements. They were talking about doing measurements, saying discreetly, saying that, you know, you would do intermittent amounts of these uh, injections of, of sulfates in the stratosphere. And then that would show you that, you know, you could see little peaks and stuff, but uh, saying it, it, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> you can't actually do that. Um, so uh, you, you would still have uh, noise and clusters and stuff. It's not that simple. So you could put a pattern, say, you know, say Morse code or something that couldn't uh, come by accident or something, and then you'd know that your, your readout of, say, whatever, the global dimming or the temperature where we came from was correlated to your actions and not just to chance and things like that. Okay, so um, now here's the, here's the interesting thing. So if you go with this idea that, uh, say, a random pattern is, is unintelligent, or you'd say then that you can tell whether something is, is unintelligent, say, a Chinese box, um, then or a bit of AI, then um, uh, you'd say, okay, that's that's fine. If, if it's doing some stuff that's not uh, uh, completely random, then you'd say it's on the path to... And all of this might sound reasonable to you, but if it does, you should uh, go and join David Keith because it's not actually, uh, it's not actually sane at all. It's not uh, valid at all. 
So here, I'll tell you this little story. <clears throat> this, uh, I once worked with this guy who was a mathematician and uh, very good at programming. And we talk, we talk maths and stuff. <laughs> and, and he, um, he said he, he had a very interesting experience where he was hired on contract by this startup company that had just got, you know, developed this random number generator. So, it, and his task was as a consultant to come and write, you know, guarantee to shareholders and investors and stuff that this product was actually putting out random numbers. And he started off thinking, okay, well, this is fine. I'll, I'll you know, this will be a piece of cake. I just have to look at, you know, distributions, make sure that everything, you know, things are evenly normalized and stuff like that. And I think it thought it'd be quite easy. Um, so he started the job and he thought, well, I better just go and look at the, the science of, you know, random numbers and just see what, <laughs> what, how you do test for random numbers. And he was shocked. Because there is no test for a random number. Nobody knows what a random number is. Now, brace yourself a little bit there. Because no, people don't generally realize this, that we don't know what a random number is. So here's the problem. If you have an infinite sequence of random numbers, you should have an infinite uh, infinite array, which is just, say, zero, zero. It's just a sequence of zero, 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 zero. So now, most people would say, okay, look at the sequence of numbers. And it would be some digits that, that look like they're nicely distributed. And they'd be like two, three, eight, five, nine, six. Three. And you know, it looks like, oh, you know, that's, it looks uh, pretty random. Well, somebody can easily show you, well, no, that's very compressible. The first sequence is actually from pi and what the, you can compress it say you know just burn a hundred digits of pi and give me the next hundred digits well that's very compressible <laughs> and it's not random at all it's digits of pi so uh, and then you look at all the zeros and and you'd say okay well that is definitely not random program it would just be like print zero a hundred times now uh, Gregory Chaitin, who is a mathematician at IBM and very keen on random numbers, and uh, uh, said that <clears throat> you know that 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 it's strange that you can have you can have an infinite sequence inside an infinite uh, set. But anyway, you, you can. It kind of blows Cantor's mind. But it, if you didn't have an infinite sequence of zeros in an infinite random number, then it's kind of a proof that it isn't random you should be suspicious that it's not random if it doesn't have endless sequence of repetition. Now, that's not what most people think, right? So then you say, well, if that's true, then what exactly is a random number? Well, it's, it's bizarre. Uh, people struggle with random numbers because, for example, a, a little while ago, there was a very popular CD that was filled with, you know, random numbers. And it was used very extensively in physics, and scientists used it. There's a lot of uses for random numbers and you know, control sets and stuff like that, um, null hypotheses and stuff. So it's very well used. But it, and, and the guy said on the CD, it's guaranteed random numbers. But, it's, but here's why it's so dark, because so many people used that CD with uh, random numbers on it, it wasn't random at all. It was, a, you know, if, you, if aliens had come and look at our science, they'd say, oh, I understand what these guys are doing. They've got a CD with the same number on it. It's not random at all. Does that make sense? But the mere fact that you stamp out a CD with a, with a sequence of numbers on it and sell it by the millions corrupts the idea that it's random. It's already been duplicated a million times and put out there as a fixed number. So it's it, it's so they were lying on the CD. The mere fact that they released it commercially in large numbers meant that it wasn't random. So so then faced with all those, they were, well, what is a random number? And so Gregory Chaitin said, you know, that um, you you can only know by knowing the source. You cannot know from an, a number whether it was uh, random or not. 
So that, he says that basically you have to look at the process that generated it, and only by looking, examining that process can you act, actually say whether it's random. You cannot tell from the output, which is not what a lot of people think. Uh, so is it, it turns out that there are only very few random sources in the universe. There's pseudo-random numbers, which are not random. But and, and in your computer, random numbers are pseudo-random numbers. They gen, have a pseudo-random number generator. But uh, by the way, all of this stuff is very important for cryptography and stuff on the, on the internet. So, I mean, it's not an obscure abstract thing that's unimportant. The whole of the internet and commerce and then military cryptography and stuff is based on on these kind of like random number seeds and things like that. So anyway, it's a very important topic. But it turns out that there are only a very few sources of random truly random data that they can find no structure in. And one of them is atmospheric noise and one of them is quantum noise. But that's pretty much your lot. <laughs> and even then there's a little bit of signal in the in the in the atmospheric noise. But um, Ryan, do you want to say anything on, on yeah. random numbers? And yeah, um, on, on the, the cryptography part, um, because it's so hard on a computer to create something that's cryptographically random, where uh, you can't predict the outcome by knowing, you know, guessing the seed, like uh, your, your operating system actually collects a pool of entropy um, from your behavior all the time. So moving your mouse and, and typing random keys and these kinds of things um, collects some randomness from outside of the computer's normal operations from the real world. And it uses that in, whenever you say generate um, you know, a key pair where you're trying to do some cryptography and, um, uh, and keep things to be more secure. But you can run out of that. And there are attacks that deplete your entropy, uh, your source of entropy by running, like generating a bunch of key pairs a lot of time. And then it becomes predictable after a certain point um, where uh, it, it, you can know which kind of random number your, your computer is going to spit out. Um, so it's, there's all kinds of uh, attacks at that level. Um, the other thing I was going to say, uh, that was just a kind of an interesting tidbit, but um, you know, the, in terms of the, uh, I think randomness itself, uh, it's good to say it, it depends on the source, but I think ultimately um, this is one of those concepts that is, um, is malformed in a way because the, it, it didn't seem to need a definition because it, you, most people understand it through analogy. So when you're you're saying, oh, just throw throw um, you know some six sided dice around and and you'll get a random number out, and that's how it's introduced to us. But it's never introduced in a formal way because uh, I think there there's a you know an innate sense of unexpectedness with a random number, and that expectation lives in our head. It's not in the mathematics. It's not in the in the world itself, uh, and uh, so when you try to actually define what randomness is, it defies a definition, right? It, uh, you can, it, because it's, it's inherently subjective to the observer. Um, and the, uh, this is, I mean, you can, you can define certain, you know, statistical properties on a distribution, but that doesn't determine whether something uh, came out like it, whether that was, um, as you said, there's a source of randomness, which is just a, you know, a sequence that doesn't, that that's evenly distributed, but that even distribution is also an expectation because you could have the sequence of one to a thousand be a random number. It's just, it wouldn't, it would defy our expectation to, to see that. So we see patterns all over. That's what our brains do. And if we see a random number source that comes with a pattern, we think it's not random because of that. But it, it, often those patterns are more likely, um, uh, are, are likely to exist. And um, so we, our, our intuitions need to be thrown out 
when we're dealing with probabilities, with randoms, with exponentials, all those little dangerous things in mathematics where our, our primate brains fail. Um, and I think this is another case of, uh, you know, entropy is something you've brought up before, Hugh, where, um, where this is something that has always been bugging me about um, how entropy is introduced in, when it's explained in physics, uh, usually of like, you can't unfry an egg or you uh, you can't put back together, you know, uh, um, uh, the like it, you'd see a, like a coffee mug falling and shattering into a bunch of pieces, and saying, "Oh, this is increasing the chaos and the entropy in the in the in the system." Um, and the the thing that is that that is missed by most of the audience if they see a clip like that is that the the, the reason that has an effect on your brain as you're processing that is because you have object recognition for the coffee cup. And then that expectation is dashed when it shatters. But the universe doesn't. Like, it doesn't ha care which piece of the coffee cup was where, right? There is some, you know, ionic bond there and now it's somewhere else. Like, it doesn't, it, that, that object permanence uh, is a is a heuristic that our brain puts into use to simplify and compress the world, but it does not. It is not the world. And when when it's uh, explained mathematically, maybe there's some sense to entropy. Um, but when it's explained by analogy, it's exploiting a weakness of our cognition to make uh, you know a false understanding of what co concept was just introduced. Yeah. Okay. So that's good. So what um, uh, I was going to propose now, well, I just one thing on what you said that I would slightly disagree with is that you can tell if something, well, you might not be able to tell when something, a process is not random. I mean, is random. Wait, uh, you might not be able to tell whether a process generates a random number. You can tell that some processes will um, not generate random numbers. So in other words, if you have a program that just says in a loop, you know, just, um, you know, print zero a hundred times, you know, execute a hundred times, uh, then that program, uh, you you could examine the mechanism and say, okay, I know that the sequence of a hundred zeros came from this program. And yeah. so, uh, so you, can, you can see logically that is all it can do, and therefore it's not random. So you can yeah, actually that's, say that's in changing like style. That there is no general purpose um, algorithm for determining whether a number is random. Just like there's no general purpose algorithm for determining, like for solving the halting problem. But in specific cases, you can tell that the program halts. Like it's it's just that kind of analogy. Yeah. Yeah. So, but so what I, what I'm going to propose now is that, like uh, the Chatham randomness, is. Uh, I would propose that also uh, intelligence is the same. It's as Ryan Ryan said. It's um, it's not a well formed idea. Intelligence is not a very well formed idea. We just we have a a rough idea like we do with randomness, and it's not really quite valid from the universe's point of view. Now, I would go against what all these people are saying. Uh, every time they, you know, you have GPT three and stuff, and there's AI comes out with something, they say, you know, look at its output. It's intelligent. I'm saying, no, that doesn't make, its output doesn't make it intelligent. You've got to look at the process that generated the output to decide whether it's mechanistic. And if it's, if it's repetitive or bounded, uh, then it's, it's not uh, intelligent. So in other words, it's clockwork and clockwork is, is not intelligent. So then you have to say, well, if it is intelligent, then it wouldn't be uh, a clockwork mechanism. In other words, synchronous. It wouldn't be chronological, right? I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but um, in I've used I've heard you use this term clockwork a lot, uh, and the thing that's missing in clocks is the feedback mechanism, which can send things into new territories that are not, you know. Uh, say algebraic numbers or something like that, where you, you have the ability to get chaos and inject it into the system. So clocks 
Um, if you just have something clockwork, it does not span the set of all things that computers can do. Because, because yeah, but uh, I'm just meaning the special the special case of the, the inputs to a clock are winding it up or giving you the energy, and uh, then then the outputs are like the dials on a hand or something like Bull and Babbage's difference engine, something like that. It's it's something where you just crank the handle, you set the knobs, crank the handle, and then you know get an output on a ticker tape. One the classic idea of of what a computer is. So uh, then. Then I think, yeah, this is what the cyberneticists and that got excited about was the the fact that if you start uh, implementing feedback, if you start you know, feeding its tail, um, then then suddenly you get all sorts of complex behavior, and so uh, and then so somewhere down that path must be the path to intelligence. So be before you can say AI is. Uh, is intelligent. You you have to look at the mechanism and say, you know, what kind of feedback process does it have, and then what 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 kind of patterns does it generate and why. So, yeah. is uh, am I still on sound ground then, Ryan? Yeah, I think um, this this is a a relevant distinction because there are many schools of AI, and many of them are in the clockwork school. So if you're doing expert systems, if you're doing, in some sense, even uh, the, the Bayesian inference stuff is, is somewhat fuzzy clockwork. Uh, fuzzy logic, there's, um, there's all kinds of theorem proving type of, of AI where you're trying to program the, the, the rules that, that you should behave. Like a lot of the self-driving car thing, like you put in some rules about how the road should, should behave, uh, how, how you should work with things and um, those tend to be very brittle in novel circumstances. So if you, um, uh, and this is where I think what caused the AI winter in the eighties is that there was a, a big attempts around this kind of clockwork AI and uh, people realized the, the limitations of this. So Japan built this fifth generation computer that was um, essentially going to you were going to program the world's knowledge into it um, and then have it you know, theorem prove your way out. The problem is, is that um, these different uh, little uh, rules, uh, it, once you get behind, beyond like 300 of these rules, it causes such an exponential blow up in the, in the search space that you never get anywhere. So it was a fool's errand from, from the get go. Um, but uh, you know, once they spent these, uh, huge sums of money trying to pursue this uh, clockwork idea, you know, it, and got almost nowhere. I mean, they got a few successes like um, jet fighter AIs that could like soar that, um, that they were able to, to implement um, through, through these logical, uh, you know, rules. Um, but it's, it's essentially child's play. It's, it's what you would program. Um, like it, it always fails on certain inputs that you give it. Now, uh, this is uh, what's interesting about that is even the deep learning models that have come out, even though they they incorporate a lot of um, you know fancy mathematics, very little uh, actual randomness in them, um, it, except for you know the topology of the network or or what have you. But they usually use, you know, calculus and continuous mathematics to try to, you know, implement the deep learning. So it is, it is somewhat um, clockworky. But it, for any of the the detection algorithms, say a, um, uh, you have a cat detection algorithm, uh, and a, something that can tell between cats and dogs or something. Uh, you you can there. There's a paper that proves that. For any input that looks, um, you can add a bit of noise to it to trick the the algorithm into detecting something completely else. This is completely different. So um, you could print out, say, a picture of a cat um, that looks exactly like a cat, and the AI, if you know what the AI is doing, you can create an adversarial example 
of a picture of a cat that will say it's like 95% a dog, right? You, you can't, um, uh, and, and this is actually one of the really dangerous things about letting these, the, these algorithms out in the wild. Because if someone has adversarial examples, um, you know, that they can print out on a t-shirt that uh, will cause uh, your self-driving car to, um, to interpret that as a, you know, uh, a shopping cart that's moving or something like that, you, you could kill people by just having a picture out in the world. Um, and, and there are, there are other, you know, um, uh, ways that this could be exploited as well. But uh, I think that that kind of separates that there, there are usually two camps, one, which is like strictly I'm programming the logical rules in, and that's very clockwork. And then there's more of the smooth, continuous, um, random number, pseudo random number generated basis of, of AI. And those are different algorithmic categories. Yeah, but uh, what I'm proposing is that the more deterministic ones um, are not, you wouldn't class them as intelligent. I wouldn't say that they are on the path to intelligence. So in other words, anything that has a perceptron and a neural net and an output kind of like the image recognition stuff, they, they're not intelligent because you, you know, they're very, they just really reflect the training set that you gave them. And that's what Google found to the, their terror when, <laughs> when they found that, um, you know, uh, they couldn't discriminate, the, the image, image recognition couldn't dis discriminate between a black couple and, and gorillas, because just because the training set looked like gorillas. <laughs> Uh, so um, it hadn't been given enough uh, uh, examples of, of black people in the people faces. And uh, so the, you know, what Google did was they just took any reference to gorillas out because I, I bet I know what they, what they did was they found that when they started putting black and white faces together, then the, the algorithm degraded terribly for recognizing faces because they're quite, quite different. And so you, you're covering too much of a, a data space that's too too disparate. But all of those kind of uh, perceptron or Im image recognition kind of things are not intelligent because of the example like of, uh, of a toddler could could figure out from, you know, if you had lots of examples in your training set of animals, most of these are trained on a very specific set, just like the CD of random numbers. There's an image set that they all use it's a, a free image set. But for example, if you had lots of animals um, and you had just one picture of a lobster, it wouldn't be able to recognize a lobster unless it was a perfect fit for that lobster. In other words, it's not getting a generalized uh, thing about what an animal is. Even a toddler would know that a lobster is a creature and just given given one lobster, you know, just a picture of one lobster, you could release a toddler on a beach and uh, Toto could run up and down the beach and find one for you. Um, but you won't get that with image recognition. So it's doing something fundamentally different in the human brain. So yeah, did you want to say something, right? Yeah, yeah, I was saying, I think that that particular issue about, about it not being able to abstract to general categories, I don't think is, uh, is a fundamental limitation of the technology. I think that that has been demonstrated that that can that can work. Um, it's uh, in the early stages of the technology that was a limitation, but there there's active research in that area, and I don't think that that's that's um, something fundamental. The other thing that I want to ask is, you know, a perceptron is a particularly hobbled, um, you know, primitive neural network. Um, and I wonder if you would take a particularly hobbled actual neuron or set of a few neurons and say, is that is that also equivalently unintelligent? So that's kind of where I'm going with all of this, is saying that if you have a look at the processes um, and Chapin style, what they are liable to produce, then, you can say, well, okay, we have an example of what 
we originally called intelligence before we started um, artificial intelligence and it's us and our brains and it's the human brain is really what we're after that's what Turing was after and so uh, you can have a look and say okay so since you have one example of a mechanism that does generate intelligence how does its operational parameters differ from the artificial ones and the first thing you can you can see is say is that what neurons are doing is fundamentally very different. Although they, they fire, so you get spikes of, ele of electricity on them, um, they're working quite different to uh, what most AI is implemented in software. But it's certainly very different to the hardware of the computer. So, for example, they have uh, some of the things that it's doing is self-organized criticality. There's quite a lot of evidence that they have cascades of things. So if you just, you know, trigger one neuron, it doesn't just fire um, and, you know, just in an isolated way. It, it cascades and gives a shower of, of neurons. There's quite a bit of research that says that it's, um, it's fractal because, uh, you know, you can show that it's scale-free and the, the, the various cascades, um, you know, have normal distribution. So it's saying that it's doing something fundamentally fractal, which is not common in, in AI. Um, so uh, if you, and, and it's very, you know, uh, subject to feedback. It's in uh, um, Hofstadter, who is kind of an AI, early AI apostate, he worked on AI in the 80s and uh, and became a, he's a, you know, became a complete non-believer. <laughs> and he wrote a book called I'm a Strange Loop, um, which is saying that humans fundamentally are a strange loop. It's, you know, has feedback pretty much like putting a camera on a monitor, on the same monitor, on its own monitor. And then you get these complex forms that are, are fractal. Um, and so our brain seems to be doing exactly that kind of thing. And I don't think I haven't heard of anybody being able to model anything like that in, in AI. But uh, I just want to show you just how an example of just how different, let's say, the hardware is, is why I say that, that AI is kind of the opposite of, of intelligence is it's, it's coming from the, the opposite angle. As, as we get closer to Moore's law, well, a kind of Moore's law has been reached now. They just replicate cause laterally now. They just have parallel processing because the end of Moore's law, maybe even by 2008. And so the reason we couldn't go any smaller in terms of nanotechnology and silicon wafers is because of the heat and they're starting to get to the quantum level and starting to get quantum interference. Now, I think a human brain is doing the opposite. It's using randomness, quantum interference, and um, somehow intelligence emerges from that. So the fact that we're starting top down and getting to the quantum level where we kind of get thwarted with AI, our brain's coming from the opposite direction. It's coming from quantum processes that then scale up to some kind of emergence intelligence. Yeah. But um, so, to, to yeah, this point, yeah, I have something I want to say there. So, to, to this point, I am not convinced yet that the um, that the action potentials in neurons are um, you know quantum influenced um, at that at the scale where the action potential you know is actually being propagated. The um, because that that quantum stuff with your you know Roger Penrose and the microtubules and all these things that's that's a bit of woo honestly um it it doesn't have um a, a enough of an an effect to to make the um the macro structures of what's happening at the at the um cellular level um be you know massively guided however I will state that there are cases in evolution that have leveraged quantum effects. And that is uh, the Van der Waals effect uh, of, if you put two plates very close together, um, the quantum 
weirdness <laughs> in between them. Casimir. Will cause me. Ka Casimir. Casimir. For. Casimir? Uh, so I, yeah, well, maybe, maybe that's but, a, a different one. Thunderbolts forces are just very connected one. It's Casimir. For. Okay, so I, I'm thinking of, uh, so maybe I'm I'm explaining that effect wrong, but I think the Van der Waals effects are um, being used in uh, the gecko's foot. Uh, so yes, yes, uh, it yes. It's it, adhe adhesion is is Van der Waals forces. Yeah, the yeah. Casimir effect is with two plates. Yeah. Okay. Uh, apologies for ex ex conflating the two concepts, but um, yeah, the that is um, the, the reason a gecko can stick to like a perfectly smooth, atomically smooth surface <laughs> um, with their with their feet is that they're using quantum effects at the at the adhesion level of, of their foot pads. So that is something evolutionarily um, arrived at that um, that does leverage a quantum effect. Uh, so there, it's it's not impossible possible for evolution to reach to that territory in, in the case of, of uh, neuroscience or whatever, uh, the, their neurology. But it, um, I don't think that, um, that that claim requires some extraordinary evidence, I think, to back it up. Um, I don't think it's as rude as you think. So, um, so what, what's happening with, with the gecko's foot is, is you essentially have branching, so it gets you know these kind of like kind of feathered branches on its um, on its pads, and they get finer and finer and finer until essentially you you're getting to quantum quantum scales, and at the end of those, so I think neurons do exactly the same thing, and so what what they've discovering now I think um, is the, the model of the neuron is too simple. The idea is just, you know, builds up a little potential and then pops and spikes and then, you know, you get this propagation going forward. Is They always have, you know, show you in this kind of diagrams that you, you have this kind of little pad and foot arrangement where the neuron sits and you have these neurotransmitters that bridge the gap and they show you the dopamine box it. And, and they always do it as, you know, sprinkled little symbols or <laughs> sprinkled little mo molecules on the foot. And I think what they're finding now is that they're complicated structures. So the the receptors and uh, the chemicals, they're not just randomly distributed. They have complex shapes and patterns. And or those those uh, there's some intelligence in those those patterns. So they're not like the little diagrams where they draw you know, little snow coming out and say, and the neurons transmitters do something. The, the, you know, it's it, like the, the foot of uh, the gecko. It goes down to infinite scales of, um, of really, really tiny structures and complicated structures. So they just getting to have a look at those and then you start to see all these amazing patterns that you would think of as more like a fractal landscape. And so I think that there's definitely something to do with fractals going on um, as, as you bore down on it. Oh, I, I definitely will agree so with that. Is there anything okay. else? Yeah, I, I want to respond to that. So um, the, the typical artificial neural network uh, model neurons have nothing to do with actual neurons. Like they're, they're essentially, um, you know, cir uh, glorified circuits. Right, um, but actual neurons are much uh, deeper biologically. Like, for example, the neurotransmitters that were mentioned. All the different neuro neurotransmitters involved in a neuron's functioning and regulation are ignored in artificial neural networks. They're, they're just not even considered, and that's uh, you know with with some exceptions where people are trying to like kind of shoehorn them in because there is a biological analog, but uh, it's uh, largely ignored. Um, and um, I think if you are to look at the structure uh, and, and how, how neurotransmitters affect different parts of the brain in drastically different ways, 
and um, and regulate uh, uh, things like that. It it I, I had an idea earlier for how you could create um, targeted uh, like drug targeting is if you had a, a vesicle with a drug in it and you had the ability to kind of count the, um, the neurotransmitter receptors of a particular pattern, you could kind of localize to a certain region of the brain, say, you know, this, um, use that as a, as an addressing mechanism to say, oh, you, you are near the pituitary gland now because this, uh, the neurotransmitter receptors are of this, in this proportion around you, right? Um, it wouldn't work because, you know, blood brain barrier and a bunch of other reasons, but, you know, it was, it was an interesting thought experiment um, when I was doing some of the neuroscience stuff. But the, um, I think the, uh, we have to look, if we're trying to really wrap our heads around how neurons work, you have, um, essentially there, there is a message passing mechanism in a way, like there's a, that calcium wave that, that passes um, from neuron to neuron, that is, um, you know, that's kind of a discrete thing in a way, um, except that the structures of the pathways that it takes are fractal. So um, the dendrites actually go and reach to multiple places and they, they're, the shape of them affects how quickly they diffuse that calcium wave and how quickly uh, and, and how many other things it touches. So the actual topology and the shape of the neurons has a lot to do with the computation that it performs. So the, the message reaching you at some point, that's, that's a discrete thing, that's computable, that's something we could do on a computer. But the actual shape is really complex. Right, that's you'd have to model it in 3D and and like simulate things along it, and it would be enormously inefficient to even get close to an approximation of it. And I think this is where we're getting into the point where uh, you can start to describe um, some of the fractal effects that you're talking about, because uh, the uh, it's it's in fact the you know these subtle you know tiny um, so, so one of the problems with um, with artificial neural networks is they're often uh, you know trained based on the weights between the 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 edges of the neurons, like the the, the connections between the nodes, um, and these weights uh, are just assumed to be um, you know uh, as you train a neural network, you are training the weights on it. However, a much greater effect on the performance of a neural network comes from the topology of the network, how the, the nodes are connected, how the neurons are connected. And often this is just, you know, slap it on a grid and hope for the best, right? And so when, when the artificial, when the AI researchers are ignoring the topology in, in, oh, or they're they're creating a layered topology where they're saying, okay, here's a grid of, of artificial neurons, and then here's another layer of artificial neurons, here's another layer. That's clockworking it, right? Where you you take different slices and say, this go here's a complete layer, and here's a complete layer, and here's a complete layer. In in the real world, neurons are completely, you know in a in a more of a chaotic mess there's no there, there are columns of neurons but they're not in the same layers um uh, like that except in the 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 v1 and v2 neurons in in your uh in your um um sorry the occipital lobe oh, right yeah, 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 very the few, very few yeah. cases are they actually you know laid out in that clockwork structure of like um you know like a like lasagna <laughs> they're they're often um you know in a web in this scale free structure right and um one of the uh so there's a there's a company out of oxford that um, designs video game AI, um, and it's called um, Natural Motion. And what's very interesting about 
the, this group of people is that they they created uh, they they had the hypothesis that the topology mattered. So what they did is they you can look them up on, online. They have animations of of these uh, virtual life forms essentially. So you build um, the idea is you have a bunch of characters, humanoid characters in games, and they have muscles that drive their motion of their skeletons, right? And those muscles are triggered by neurons in an artificial neural network. And that artificial neural network has a topology that's, um, that's evolved with a genetic algorithm. So uh, it uses the, uh, it, it takes um, generations where it starts randomly giving you neurons and then says, okay, the fitness function is if you take a single step correctly, then you did better than someone who didn't do a single step. If you take two steps, you're better off. And um, essentially to try to train it to walk from nothing, from start from zero and just train it to walk. And originally it just flails on the ground. And then after 20 or 30 generations, this thing is walking naturally like a human. And it's not a baked in animation. It's something that where the, it's actually driving an artificial body, right? And they're, they're using this, this, um, this topology of the network um, as, as a major tuning parameter to, that, that evolution is saying, okay, this shape of the network is better at walking and then during the course of its training, it can actually change the weights and stuff to learn better. But it's um, uh, the, the, the broad strokes, the most important thing is actually the shape. And that's largely lost by most AI research. Yeah, so, okay, you've covered a lot of stuff here and <laughs> about a million things to say. Um, uh, okay, so, but, but just let me, absolutely agree with with all of this and i think where where i'd like to try and go get to is an idea that um you can't just like switch on the lights and start doing some training algorithm um even an evolutionary thing like uh, uh what's the name of motion stuff uh that um uh, without running up against the problem that we've had you know 3.4 million years of evolution so at some point your AI system is borrowing human intelligence. Uh, you know, if certainly for all the kind of image recognition things and a lot of the stuff that is AI is uh, supposed to be AI. It's not really. It's just using. It's leaning on humans' AI and trying to get relationships that you know that it, like a Chinese box. It has no intelligence itself. It just knows that humans have some innate reason to connect to things. And so it manages to cluster things and, and mimic uh, intelligence that's really got to do with the programmers and the people that set up the training algorithm and the goals more than it does itself. Whereas biological things have um, a pattern that's been evolved. So the intelligence has come out of evolution. And so intelligence might be a very long drawn out thing. It's not something you can just cheat and do you know, by brute force, by trying to catch up with evolution by doing 10 million, 10 million uh, iterations of something. Um, but, okay, now I just wanted to go back to the woo stuff on the, you know, uh, Penrose and, and those guys. Um, I, I think that there's other evidence that there's quantum effects. And one outside is, uh, if you take things like cosmic rays and uh, look at, say, uh, the, the damage that a cosmic ray will do to a computer, then you know, transistors are generally made on some kind of grid lattice format, some kind of circuitry like that. And generally, when you get a, a cosmic ray hitting them, you just it takes out one bit. So there are all these classic things about how you know, the selection was thrown by four, you know, 4,096 votes and stuff. And it, they, they showed that it was a bit flip. Um, to do a cosmic ray. Um, but then you only get a one bit flip. Now that doesn't happen with a neuron. So if you have a look, so there, there's a famous case of a guy in, in Russia who, who stuck his head in a, in a collider, like a linear accelerator, like the Large Hadron Collider. 
um, he, it was an accident. The, the, the warning mechanisms weren't working. He, he walked into the room where this had uh, a beam that was in the free air, and he put his head right right in it. Um, it's uh, and so and he lived um, with a lot of trouble. But um, it's interesting to what he said. Uh, he saw. He said, "Now it came and hit him in the nostril and came out the back of his occipital lobes." And he said it just looked like a thousand thousand suns. He said just this massively bright light, which is kind of interesting, because if you think of what that is, it's a very, very tiny beam, and most of it will be stopped by the, the water in his head. It wouldn't, uh, you know, absorb all the energy. Um, that's why he's still alive. Uh, but um, so it it wouldn't, you know, it's kind of uh, wasn't enough to block all the radiation. But it's very interesting that he said that, you know, it's a very, very bright version of what astronauts see. So the astronauts, when they're in orbit, they started seeing all these flashes of lights. And they eventually figured out all the, the cosmic rays hitting their brains. Now, I don't think they know whether it's hitting their eyeballs or optic nerves. I think it can hit anywhere in their brain and they can see a bright light. If it hits, if it causes a cascade in the occipital lobe, it'll cause a bright light. So that, that means just one charged particle can uh, initiate some self-organized criticality in a cascade. I think that implies that there the, at least is the potential for you know, uh, single particle interactions that uh, lead to large effects inside the brain. So that seems like so, a falsifiable so, yeah. hypothesis where we could uh, measure the amount of cosmic rays in a given volume and then measure the amount of um, perceived white flashes or, or flashes in, in a person under those same conditions and uh, see what percentage of the brain hit causes those. And you could, you could test your hypothesis there. Yeah, it's very testable. As if you just got somebody to just sit still in an in an fMRI machine for a while, but uh, ostensibly, you could actually um, track like any kind of target in an accelerator in a particle accelerator. You could actually um, track the splintering through somebody's head and find the exact path that it went through, and um, then see what what occurred on an fMRI or but yeah, I mean, I I think you could play with. Uh, you know, there's so many. They just switch off the lights, and you, you will see them. There's so there's so many. That it would be actually practical to to test it. But I think if you compare that, you know, you get a one bit flip, and then you know you get a a massive effect um, in the brain. It tells it it shows that there are very very fundamental. Um, triggers in 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 the neurons. Well, it, it does. It suggests that to me anyway. But uh, so so another thing that's that's going on that's not going on in um, in AI and in in most neural nets you know, and simulations, which I think makes them kind of clock, clockworky, is that um, the plasticity of the brain is very very high. And in fact, it's so extraordinarily high that some uh, you know, some bits of the brain are repurposed within an hour. So the, I saw one neurologist came up with a the theory that perhaps the reason why we dream is we keep on refreshing that part of the, the brain so that it doesn't get co-opted and get used for something else. So in other words, he's thinking of it kind of like DRAM, direct random access memory in a computer. But what happens in a DRAM thing is memory degrades and volatile memory in the computer degrades. So what DRAM has is it has a little circuit that goes and reads a bit and then reinforces it. You know, so it says if it's off, it you know, reinforces that it's off, and if it's on, it refreshes it. And it just goes round and round the memory continually doing this dynamic refreshment uh, of whatever state it's already in. And so, um, that's, so, a, that's an interesting um, um, model, but I think it's also um, th there's more to it than that. In that, 
during sleep, um, th there's a difference between your short-term memory and your long-term memory. And there's a process where you take your, um, uh, say, your, your short-term memories that, and you move them to areas of your brain which are specialized for those kinds of things so that it's a faster processing later when it needs it. So that's called long-term potentiation. So um, it, you, uh, a writ, as you're having short-term memories and you're experiencing, uh, those, those, are, those are relatively temporary, but it, if you had a visual memory, say, it would move more towards the occipital lobe um, so that it would be quicker to ask, access. It's like a cache, right? Um, and that's so no, uh, this that that happens when yeah, you so read. this question is to the uh, oh so no yeah but they, they're speculating on that that's just one theory for, for dreaming but with this plasticity that i'm talking about is is uh for things like if you remove a limb so uh it's you know or say if somebody's blind or deaf, the, the, the circuits that get used for hearing um, get repurposed and get used for sight and for other things. Um, and so uh, I'm talking about like if, if somebody has a limb removed, that we have a representation of, of the stratic part of here, I think, that of our whole body. And so if you have a body alteration, within an hour, something else will take it over. It's, it is that quick. So when, when they discovered just how plastic it was, it implies that, you know, um, it implies a lot to me. One of the things is, is how is it organized? If it's, if it's so chaotic and there's so much competition for real estate, um, how does it mean to be, uh, remain stable? And I think the answer is that it must be self-organized. So it must have an org that uh, must go very deep. Um, and it must have something to do with evolution, it must have something to do with the structure, it must have something to do with the chemistry. But since we only have a small number of genes to express 70 billion neurons, it, it, it must uh, organize itself in some internal principle, not only discovery in the environment. So there's something drastically missing in, in AI because it kind of ignores, like you were saying, the internal architecture and just as it assumes you know inputs processes and outputs that kind of thing or exploring the environment and saying no it's something as fundamental as tree branching or something like that because they, they know that the hebbian model is correct that hebbian learning is you know if it fires together it wires together so that is a simple rule that sounds very much like a fractal algorithm if things fire together and wire together, then they, they will start to, you know, fight Boltzmann entropy. Uh, so, what do you what do you think, Brian? I mean, Brian. Well, I, I think yeah, Hebbian learning is definitely a thing. Um, there are, but you also have to take into account the different modalities due to the different presences of uh, neuro, neurotransmitters and stuff, because um, that Hebbian learning doesn't factor that in at all. Um, but it, it's a, um, and I think we have that bias in our artificial intelligence, um, models as well, because we understand electricity and, and wiring things together and, and we're applying that. And I think this is one of the, the problems when we're dealing with these, um, these analogies and, um, on our mental models when we're talking about AI and, and um, or, or how we see things, because we tend to use our technology of the day as the analogy for our minds. So back in the, uh, the earlier days of psychology, when we were dealing with steam technology, uh, you would say, oh, he's blowing off steam, or it, we, we use this clockwork or this, um, you know, steam analogies of how, um, of how our intelligence has worked. Um, and, uh, and that, that is, uh, you know, still present in our language in many, many places. Uh, and it's, it's how we think about things. Now we've switched to you know, we've got these these integrated circuits, and and uh, so we have a RAM over here, and we have our CPU over here, we have a disk over there, and um, 
And then we're saying, okay, this part of the brain is kind of like that. And we have these separated modules that are isolated from each other that do things functionally. And that is provably wrong, right? Um, in how our brain actually works. So the there is no isolated um, functionality because of this plasticity. Because we have the ability to, to usurp various modules with other ones, uh, it means that the this this alien cortex way of like drawing a boundary around stuff and labeling it with a name that is not actually the implementation of intelligence in the brain so this is another reason why the um the, there's like this whole school of ai that's based on deriving like uh encoding ontologies where you're saying okay i'm gonna Here's this module. Here's that module. They're going to talk. They're going to connect. But they're they're you know large organs in the system. That's typical of how you do software engineering, but not how you should be approaching AI, because that's that's uh, fundamentally uh, not how these systems tend to compose. They tend to um, not have clear boundaries well, in the brain. Yeah, agreed. But but they're. This, there's some ambiguity here because, like, and um, you know, my five layer brain, <coughs> five layer brain model, is exactly that kind of compartmentalization. But it's not, um, and so there is uh, specialization on those levels because of um, evolution. They don't operate independently. So I think maybe <coughs> trying to do uh, modularize AI. Is uh, is a mistake because <clears throat> they they don't. Uh, there's a lot of crosstalk and feedback, and um, there's a hierarchy, and which is probably not represented in these kind of modules. Like say for driving things, is like this this one does telemetry, this one does rec spatial recognition, this one, <laughs> and then you try and wire them all together. But uh, they it's you correct what you say that the the biology or neurology is is not made in those compartments because uh, nature just doesn't see an end to where the brain starts and ends and so for example your stomach has um, a large part of your brain is in your stomach the, the neurons in your stomach you have as many neurons it's about as big as a cat's brain so so you have a brain the size of your cat that's in the wall the lining of your stomach now not a lot of people know that um, uh, but the brain just, you know, it's, it's, you know, the neurons themselves have a large supporting cast of glial cells and all these different types of, of cells and uh, processes and neurotransmitters. And it's not at all plain that nature sees it as, you know, oh, everything uh, on this side of the blood brain barrier is brain and everything else is body. And it's, um, the system is, is so intertwined. It's um, it, you, you sh making you sort of making a mistake th thinking of it like a car and saying, well, this bit's the carburetor, this bit's the radiator. Here's the battery. Um, there there are evolutionary kind of uh, specialization tasks. So it's it is true that there are functional layers. It's just how they interoperate and how they actually you know manage to have this kind of um, self-organization is is the mystery and I think we, we can't do AI until we, we figure out exactly what that mystery is so what, I, what is I agree the self-organization in principle I, re I agree with you that in order for AI to be properly um, implemented it should be probably grown uh, rather than programmed where you are uh, like one of the properties of, of life that's very different than almost all engineered systems is that uh, from the, the zygote level, it has to be viable all the way up to the macro like uh, um, phenotype, the organism, right? So uh, if you had a, um, you know, you can't just take a bunch of modules and shrink them down to the size of a zygote and have it still be, you know, analogous all the way through. There's some epigenetic process where it, it uh, grows and, 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 um, and the principles behind 
the the learning and things like that can't be even in the genetics themselves because of what you mentioned earlier. It has to be some some kind of a self-organized criticality at, at a certain scale that that um, makes up for the lack of information in the in the genome uh, to describe that. And I think we what what I'm uh, very keen on uh, outlining is that there uh, while there are clockwork methods for encoding information in a computer. Uh, like if you're using a floating point number, it's very, very susceptible to a bit flip being a very large error, right? Um, or, but if you're, if you're using a, um, a different topological encoding with where you, you, you're distributing the bits in a more of a holographic way where you're not making, um, you're making it a lot, a, a lot more redundant and those and having that parallel processing and relying on timings and feedback, like all of those are possible with our current um, understanding of computing. And it would get closer towards actual, what I think we could agree on would be more intelligent. It's not commonly done, but it's not a fundamental limitation of, of the, um, the hardware, I think. There are probably fundamental limitations of the hardware, but the technique we use to implement the algorithms is, is also a major factor that I don't want to conflate. I think there are the, the criticisms that you have of the algorithms that are being used or of AI in general, you're saying they're hardware limitations. And I think in many cases, they are uh, simply choosing the wrong algorithm to solve the, what you're describing. So I want to lay the criticism where it sh should land um, and make sure that we're not making a, yeah, a my, category error. No, my fundamental objection is is that they are approximations. So they're not, um, they're not doing the same, the same thing because they're not going down to the same resolution. So in other words, it's kind of like uh, you know a tree as opposed to a lollipop tree. So what we're doing with AI is uh, trying to mimic a tree with a kind of a lollipop version. You know, um, it's it's a sketch of a, a simplified sketch of a tree, and so it's it's as as removed as a lollipop tree from a genuine tree. Um, and so so yeah so. I guess we should round it off somewhere here. But what, what I'm saying is it is a fundamental limitation because if you tried to, uh, I think, to do a, a good approximation of intelligence, you'd have to, like you say, start off with embryogenesis, start off with an embryo, have that embryo split, and you would, you know, through uh, genesis-like embryogenesis, you would get to a primitive brain and a smarter brain and it would self-organize into something which then is semi-intelligent enough to explore the world and wire itself up just like a, a baby does. And I think you'd have to go that route. If you went that route, I think if you if you just say implemented each neuron or each cell or anything involved in it, you'd have these 70 billion cells. It wouldn't be enough to just say that, you know, we, we have we, we, re we represent all the states or all the, the mechanism in one of those neurons with, say, like 1K worth of, of silicon memory. If you, if you did that, you'd be short thousands of uh, magnitudes of what a neuron is actually doing because there's structure and pattern that goes probably all the way down to the plank length. And yeah. so... <laughs> There's too much information in one neuron, and it, it, I, I totally can't be agree with you on that. Under the rug. Right. Yeah. By the way, I, I think that uh, this is more a criticism for the you know Alcor and the the, the cryogenics people or the people who want to upload to silicon. Is that yeah, you may be able to get a coarse um, approximation of your the structure of your brain that can you know, give you similar outputs that your brain would for, you know, for a few seconds or minutes, but then it would drift so wildly that, that you couldn't um, simulate it further uh, with, it wouldn't be you. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so so okay, so let's let's round it off there. But I'll leave you with one kind of thought that if you pursued this kind of this kind of, this line of thought, I think that if you tried to do a very thorough job of mimicking the human brain, you would eventually find that the self-organization comes from something which we don't understand. So, for example, we would it has something to do with say the structure of water, or the you know the Finds, you know, you'd have to know the fine structure constant of the universe to actually, you know, get the kind of um, behavior out of out of the brain that, that you see, and so you would run up against a fundamental limit, where, where there is intelligence baked into the structure of the universe, and we, it's just not accessible to us. May, may I add something that is more biological because that's more my realm? But you mentioned embryology. And you mentioned the the early development of of brain as as a, as intelligence functioning material on a material basis, but the the tissue of the of the neuroderm it's one of the three tissues that differentiate at a very early stage in the embryo. The embryo is a, is made of undifferentiated cells until a very advanced. Uh, what well, advanced in terms of of evolution of uh, of its development. So. Uh, Around around a few weeks, around five six weeks, there starts to be appearance even before that of three tissues: one the neuroderm, the metaderm, the ectoderm, and each are going to specialize into muscle, skin, etc., nervous system, and and things like that. And I think I think that's where we want to look at intelligence and and what you say about self organization. And I think that that's that's the thought I, that came immediately into my mind is this this. This moment, this this uh, yeah, this stage where you come from something that is undifferentiated to suddenly a self-organizing being. Yeah, I think that's yeah, that's really really powerful. Um, do you mind if I? Uh, yeah, I that's, take that's where I was trying to go. Yeah, um, I, I think the the um, that self-organization I think is a really uh, critical principle. And we know that it has to be in, uh, applied in the case of the brain because uh, the genetic information isn't enough, right? So, um, but when you take an adult brain and you try to digitize every neuron in it and um, make a simulation, that's not the principle of, of getting to intelligence, right? If you, if you have a simple principle like heavy and learning, like things that wire together, fire together, that is something that you can encode in a computer. And if we don't understand it yet, it doesn't mean it's from some quantum woo source, right? It could be something fairly mundane in chemistry that we don't understand. It could be just a, a principle uh, yes. that is complicated that we don't understand uh, in how things wire together, right? But uh, those things are are necessarily like if you were to encode um you know the the genome in a computer that's doable right and and that encodes you know some of the the um uh you know when when you put it in the world uh and and your ribosomes get a hold of of that you you can get some proteins that that cause some effects right so it's there's um it's the fact the 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 principle behind the the AI that I think um, that rather than the, the structure of an adult brain that might hold the key to intelligence and it doesn't have to look like our brain. Yeah. So, we'll, but here uh, I'm trying to land this, but anyway, it's kind of bounced back into the air again. So, um, yeah. So, what uh, even when you talk about wiring together in a Hebbian model. I think even wiring is a false analogy. Wiring is, a, is again, one of these oversimplifications of uh, a process. It's, it's not like getting two relays or electrical contacts and wiring them together. The rules for actually branching and wiring uh, must have some intelligence in that. So what, what I'm, I'm saying is that it might be in this infinite regress of, uh, of knowledge that, you know, one thing begets the other. So the, the reason why I say this is because I get a, you see, I've had feet in many disciplines and 
I'll just tell you this one thing from the glass industry, which really <laughs> made me start to have grave doubts about, you know, my colleagues in software and things like that, and especially doing AI and machine intelligence. So, so when I did this glass first, I um, I na naively thought, like a computer programmer, that you know we needed for this application we needed to have like 256 different shades of colors of glass um the molten glass had to flow we had, had to get a one-ton furnace and i thought i thought you could model all of this stuff and so i had all these the best microwave experts in the world and glass experts and everything and i you know i said we, you know we can do i started down the path of because i'm software program i think of doing numerical models to try and model all of these things and use navier stokes and stuff to model the flow of molten glass and i uh, i got into the lecture li literature and it, i found it was like this is impossible it's like nobody knows anything and i went and asked these guys and they said yeah it's a long-standing problem is it's like nobody knows how to model flowing glass and I said, what are you talking about? It's just maybe a stove. But it says, no, it, it changes radically. You just put a tiny different ingredient in and stuff. Nobody knows what glass is doing while it's molten. And they've done tons and tons of research at Crystal Ogre. And you say, come on, you, what? They say, no, nobody knows. Says, and then I started to discover that we get given this very thin slice of physics where we pretend we know this a tremendous amount. But when you start trying to do something like a glass furnace, you find out we don't know fuck all. So the answer to some people who say like, oh, we might be living in the matrix. It might all be a computer simulation. It isn't because you could do an experiment in the corner where, you know, computer programmers wouldn't know. I, I could go into the matrix and prove I'm in the matrix because I'd melt a bit of glass. And then they'd say like, I could just prove how it ran and how, you know, different temperatures. And, I, and then they would have to do a fudge the guys who programmed the matrix because no one knows this for how glass flows and how it heats and anything. So I asked these guys, like, what about the colors? He said, well, you know, you had green, it turns, you know, you, you have to add iron. Copper, it turns light blue. Make it a little bit different temperature, turns kind of orange. You know, beryllium turns blue, you know, cerulean yellow, all this kind of thing. He said, but, but what are the rules? I need to know this formulaically. So we can feel and said, like, no one knows. It's just experimentation. It goes back. They only know that cobalt makes it blue because that's what the ancient Egyptians did. Nobody know. Everybody knows that it's to do with the structure of the, the glass and, the, you know, how it's uh, long range structure and a few Armstrongs and how it's absorbing them. Nobody can model it because nobody has a clue what's going on. And so it said, like, well, how is anything done? They said, it's all done by experiment. They just, you know, numerical methods, I found out from everything from jet planes to glass and process, you know, manufacturing is they only do numerical me methods late in the day after they've done everything by hand. But even I uh, spoke to an aeronautical engineer and I thought in naively in my youth, I thought that, you know, jet engines were all modeled by computers and stuff. And then, you know, they didn't start manufacturing them until all the thing was all modeled and stuff it says no all the thing is done is you know the 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 in you know the aeronautical engineer says now nah, i think we'll get a bit more efficiency if you add a little flange on the end and then the the you know the the fabricators say uh how big and he goes about that big and then they go and just try everything it's all trial and error and then when you're the last five percent of efficiency then you start modeling it but they virtually don't know what they're doing in anything in the world. So That's by the time you start modeling biology and stuff, it's like we can't even fucking figure out how to And they've tried. Nobody has a theory for glass flows. I was appalled. Right. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, no. Um, I made a, what you were saying about the structure the of water. Outside is... and made progress in that area because I just had a few different ideas that I could try out. So I got some, some regimes to model the glass, which... I should have published papers and stuff, but anyway. Anyway, I just put that out there to show you how quickly we'll be overwhelmed when we get into the intelligence of actually how embryogenesis works. And, you know, if you go from stem cells all the way up to cell specialization, then that process 
is some kind of fractal intelligent self-organizing process that must rely on things which we would soon run into say oh my god this is a whole field of chemistry nobody <laughs> nobody knew about so in other words we, we really have a very very primitive understanding and but people talk as if we understand the universe and can model it and we have powers that we just absolutely do not that's absolutely yeah. correct i think the the number of um of uh, differential equations that we can actually solve analytically is, you know, a tiny, tiny fraction, less than 1%. Right? We, uh, and the Navier Stokes is one of them. So if we think we understand, you know, we've discovered the fluid simulation algorithm uh, or, or the, the equation for it, has no we have no clue about what the possible solutions of that are. Like it, it's, we, we can simulate it out, but we have no analytical solution for it. And, um, that's so when you're talking about the finite like the, the small structure of water and stuff yeah there would be no simulation for that um that, that we could trust and, um in in the case of and then then you would lose part of the dynamic behavior so that yeah. you, you would you would say that you know this is detectable it would because you could look at the mechanism and say whoever did this doesn't understand how how water works <laughs> at different temperatures and then, right. so again back to chotam and looking at the mechanism you could say ah this is a fudge right um and i think this gets back to um you know even if you could say discover the uh you know self-organizing self criticality um algorithm uh the core of that algorithm, like Navier-Stokes equation or something, there's no guarantee that you would be able to implement it in a way that would actually uh, yield the results that you want for a particular domain. And the way that you can organize these domains is similar to how we were able to, uh, you know, try to extract entropy from the, your mouse movements and these kinds of things. It's like you need some input from Earth, from the outside world, if you're trying to uh, deal with that domain. And in the case of um, AI where it's playing itself in a game, that's totally described and it can move very quickly where it just plays itself really, really fast. But in a case where you need, uh, for, for self-driving cars, you need to actually go around and drive a lot uh, and gather that information. So it's a huge amount of data and then you can kind of match on that. Uh, in, and for many other things, it's too slow for feedback um, to, to, to run the experiment. So building a jet engine and putting it in a wind turbine is an example. Every time you do that, it's very important to, to, to get the feedback. It takes you know a month to build a to build what you need and see the result. So you only get a certain number of tries. In order for AI to be effective, you need to ha be able to have thousands, millions of tries, and those are only available in small domains where the the the, the computer can ex, can um, can make legible the world around it, and that's where we're ending up with our problems in the world. So is, it's a constrained environment. I personally don't think there will ever be autonomous truck cars driving around cities because you you get them at airports and you have them on freeways because that's a constrained environment where humans aren't permitted, and so where they you know can keep everything uh, in a restricted domain and predictable domain, yeah, then, because it's kind of like some version of a railway track. So yeah, you'll have, you know, since the 80s, they had in Docklands light rail, they had trains without drivers. But that's because they were on rails on these easy, <laughs> it's a very constrained system. So you can have, you know, a Tesla on a freeway and it can do a, kind of a driverless train thing. but. They're not really getting ahead with autonomous vehicles. They, it's the same shit as the 80s. They're just pretending and bullshitting everybody. But they, they're not getting any further ahead on a, what it's like on a street where you can have, you know, like, uh, you know, just the shape of leaves or something which look like a traffic light or a person crossing or, <laughs> you know, and uh, it's just too unpredictable in that chaotic environment where humans don't struggle in that environment because, you know, they have no, no, because they're doing something fundamentally different. They, you know, if a dinosaur jumped out, 
you would be able to swerve around it. Whereas you know, autonomous car might go, oh, dinosaur wasn't in my training set. Bang. <laughs> it's that kind of stupidity. I heard anyway, a good example of that. Um, where I had a friend you want to say the last one? Say, and then we could ever round it. Oh, sorry. Just a quick one. Uh, yeah, I just had a good example of that where a friend worked for Mercedes Benz and he said that, um, yeah, they were really struggling with the English roads, you know, the because they're old roads. And the AI, yeah, that works fine for autonomous cars on motorways, you know, lane changing and exiting the, the motorway. But, um, you know, on, on the English country roads, it's really old lanes and they can't deal with, uh, you know, with all the sort of foliage and the, you know, the ins and outs of these tiny little B roads. They <laughs> just can't deal with it. I'm really struggling with that. Well, well, this is this comes back to the to the general bigger discussion about the dangers of AI, and the biggest danger is that because AI's environment needs to be constrained, is they will make us serve the machines rather than have the machines serve us. So that's where it all lands, is that you know because they only work in a constrained environment, they will make us fit the you know one size fits all constrained environment offered by AI while telling us, oh, AI is going to do everything for everybody. And it's, no, we're going to become slaves to the fucking machine. We always were. Right from 10,000 years ago, they warned everybody that machines make slaves out of you. They never serve you. So that's the biggest problem about AI, is everybody thinks they're making you know domestic robots to serve them, and they're not. We've been turned into slaves to my surplus big Moloch machine. All right, we better end it. Yeah, end it yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, let's let's just pause and uh, just let everything go. See the phosphines behind your eyes, and maybe next time that's what I wanted to talk about is DMT and psychedelics, hallucinations, stuff like that. If AI can't do that kind of stuff, why can't it? And what's the human brain doing with psychedelics that's fundamentally different to a machine? So that maybe that's the next installment. But you can you can see straight away the by looking behind your eyelids, if you look long enough, I think some people said they couldn't see any lights or phosphines or anything. It's because you are not in the right state. Uh, you haven't got to like the beta levels in your brain where things are really slowing down and you becoming relaxed, you concentrating, you watching the phosphines feeding back and creating more phosphines the more you watch. It's that feedback loop and in those phosphines in your eyes you can see fractal patterns and those kind of get expressed with hallucinogens and, and entheogens, psychedelics. But you have them for free. You don't need to pay anybody or use illegal drugs. They're just right there in your brain. Rest in those. And absorb your... Observe your own intelligence in those patterns. The eye seeing the eye. Om Paramatma Nenama Iti. Well, <laughs> I hope that wasn't too boring for people. Um, I, I really enjoyed talking to to Ryan about it and people, but um, it, uh, was it too slow for people? No, thank you. Thank you, you very much. We'll review it. It's a lot. Yeah, sorry if we use jargon a bit, but um, if, if there's anything that you want us to go over in more detail, and de jargonize it with, with try. It's like going to science grad school. All right, everyone. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Apologies on that. Interesting um, ideas, though, that we're exploring. Yeah, do yes, stop yes, Thank you. It is interesting. If, <laughs> yeah. We'll try to use less jargon. Yeah. But if we'll just explain it just when yeah. it comes up, just be sure to explain it. Yeah, yeah, good idea. All right, everyone. Well, happy Halloween. All right. Don't get yes. run over by autonomous vehicles. Ha 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 ha. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Until next Bye. time. Bye. Bye.